afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Black Excellence Recognition Month. This is a presentation uh, brought to you by The Village Demands. I am Dr. Dana Emerson. I am the current president of The Village Demands, and I'd like to welcome you to this event. I'd like to also give you a little bit of information about The Village Demands. We are an organization that was created uh, to reduce or eliminate anti-Black racism in the community college system or actually higher education altogether. We are focused on uh, creating um, racial literacy, critical consciousness, and cultural fluency. The Village Demands is part of the statewide coalition on Black American affairs. And again, I'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon for a riveting uh, discussion and opportunity to participate with others in your area um, in this Black History Month celebration. We are preparing to bring to you a libation ceremony, um, some, excuse me, and uh, sorry, and some poetry. And then we have a keynote speaker here. So at this time, I am going to start and introduce the libation ceremony by Dr. Takima Mayasa. Dr. Mayasa, please join us. Greetings, everyone. Hotep, I greet you in peace, love, and prosperity. My name is Dr. Takima Mayasa, and I have the pleasure of taking and performing this libation ceremony. The libation ceremony is a very important opening to any event for us as African people. It is an opportunity for us to invite the ancestors to come and to bless the event that is about to take and be imparted upon and to bless the participants who are here spending their time on this Friday to enlighten themselves, to become inspired for the work that has to be done, not only in education, but in the world. And, and as such, we ask the ancestors to not only to bless this event that we're here upon, but to inspire us to take and do our very best in whatever that may be that we are tasked to do, recognizing that each and every one of us has a special gift that only we can give to the world, that it is our responsibility to nurture, to develop it, and to share it with everyone because there is only one of us and there's only one gift that um, we can give in terms of ourselves. And certainly not just one gift, generally speaking, but it's the idea that we are irreplaceable. And so that being said, I call upon the ancestors to take and be with us the, with the special messaging that is here today to bless the participants. And again, the speakers that are here to take and inform us of not only what's happening in the world, but also what's happening here in higher education. We know our ancestors fought uh, vehemently for education, understanding that education is key to success. It is the first step of success of anything through knowledge of self. And knowledge of self empowers us to understand that no matter where we are and what we do, that we have what we need to do anything that we ever want to do, right? And, and as such, we also ask the ancestors in this um, to bless the those who are yet to be born those of us who are the guardians and the keepers of young people, understanding that uh, we are the example for, for them and that the education that we've received and the education that we're imparting upon um, our children, um, our young adults, et cetera, is not just in a classroom, that life is an educational process that we will forever be participating in, Ashe. We ask uh, from the North, from the South, from the East and from the West, <clears throat> that all aspects of the world that we live in, that we recognize and understand that African peoples have been a part of creating civilization everywhere in the world. And that we didn't just start there, that we are the progenitors of humanity because there's only one race, it's called the human race, and we're all members of that. That being said, you'll see behind me, I have the uh, Kwanzaa table 
Uh, those of you who are familiar with the African-American celebration of Kwanzaa know that it is a seven day celebration of principles of that we have as African peoples that we have brought over and sustained here that has sustained us through um, this experience is called an American experience. It starts with a black candle of unity as the first principle, Kuji Chakulia, which is self-determination, Ujama, collective work and responsibility, Ujima, um, cooperative economics, um, Nia, purpose, Kawumba, creativity, and finally Nia, which is purpose, which we all which we all have. Um, that being said, uh, I mean faith, I'm sorry, uh, Imani is faith. And to have the faith that all of us will take and be able to fulfill the purpose that we all come here to, to do. That being said, and that this is something that we do all year round and not just at the end of the year, that these principles are guiding principles in all the work that we do and all the th things that are part of our development as human beings. So that being said, if you will, we have the, the plant behind us, which represents life. The water that all life uh, uses, we can go without food, but you cannot go without water. And so we ask that the ancestors bless this event, Ashe. We ask that the ancestors take and guide us as we um, embrace the information that we will be receiving today. And as such, uh, in part with this information so that we can take and develop ourselves and develop our communities. And lastly, know that all things are possible with, with the guidance of our ancestors and the creator, the most high, the divine of all things, <clears throat> and that we would commit ourselves to be the very best of ourselves this day and every day. Ashe. And so it is. Akira. Peace and blessings to everyone. And I hope you'll be here to enjoy this magnificent presentation. Ashe. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Thank you, Dr. Mayasa, for opening up and welcoming our ancestors into this space with us today. Um, just a few housekeeping um, things before we dive deeper into our agenda for today. So again, um, your videos will be off and muted. You can please use the chat feature at the bottom or the Q&A um, on your control panel to ask um, questions as we're going through our webinar today. Um, for our event today, you can use the hashtag and social media hashtag The Village Demands and hashtag TVD Black History Month on your um, social media page. Um, you can view our other hashtags at the end of the program, which we just dropped in the chat for everyone here. And so this webinar is being recorded. And so you can ask your PIO to contact Brandon Christian and we'll put our, his contact information in chat in a little bit to obtain a copy of the recording. For those who need closed captioning located on the bottom of your screen, you will see the closed captioning. You can turn that on. Um, please do use the Q&A or the chat feature to ask questions throughout today's webinar. We will do best to address any questions as they come up. So with further ado, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Ori Johnson. So Ori is a professor, a painter, and a, poet, and a pottery potter. And she loves, um, she's just a beautiful spirit in general. She also loves decolonizing the higher education landscape by implementing inclusive pedagogy that is unapologetically centers historical and systematically marginalized and unrepresented communities. She strives to make her teaching and curriculum practices standard rather than the anomaly. So Ori, welcome. Hi everyone, hi. All right, so just a little preface to the poem that I have written. So I was going to originally perform um, another poem, but last weekend I went to the Conservatory of Flowers in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And I was just really inspired then um, just to see like what could happen um, if we are given the perfect conditions, right? And so given the perfect conditions, we can all be like the best versions of ourselves, but what happens when we're not afforded that chance? So um, that's a little inspiration behind the poem for today. All right. Given the most perfect conditions, we can all thrive. 
but how often do we get the opportunity to access those perfect conditions or have access to the perfect resources that are integral to our survival so that we are not only able to survive, but thrive? We frequently hear that. We grow the most when things aren't perfect. We grow the most when we are uncomfortable, when the path is unclear and we need, we need to dig deep and excavate to find the strength and light and revelry. But what would our lives look like if we didn't have to fight for survival, if we didn't have to fight to be heard, if we didn't have to fight for the light? What if we had the perfect conditions where we didn't have to try to consciously survive, but were able to unconsciously thrive and just exist in our greatness, exist as the fullest embodiment of our utmost potential? When given the most perfect conditions, most predictable things are possible. When given the most perfect conditions, we are able to be the best versions of ourselves, the shiniest, juiciest, most vibrant versions of ourselves. But this is easy when there are no roadblocks, no landslides, no craters in your path. It's a beautiful thing. But what is also beautiful is when you're able to jubilantly jump over the roadblocks, glide over the landslides and soar over those craters and thrive and grow and shine and be the best, most vibrant, shiniest version of yourself. By any means necessary, find your light, find your joy, find your happiness, find you. Thank you. Thank you, Ori, for that. And that reminder, as you said, that even though we grow when things are uncomfortable, there is, is so much possibility when we have the environment and the setting around us that helps us flourish that much more. Uh, I'm Lakeisha Bradley, and it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker to everyone today, a man who might not need the introduction uh, because he is a very familiar um, force in the equity work that we have seen in and outside the California Community Colleges, um, and that is Dr. Lasana Hotep. He is an anti-racist, anti-sexist educator, writer, an equity advancing executive coach who writes and speaks globally about educational equity, anti-Blackness, and racial justice within organizations and society at large. He has delivered transformative multimedia presentations throughout the United States and abroad in Beijing, China, and Accra, Ghana. Ghana. As a writer, he has contributed to seven books and is the co-author of the recently published Minding the Obligation Gap in Community Colleges and Beyond Theory and Practice in Achieving Educational Equity. For more than 20 years, Lasana has provided equity advancing consultation to academic institutions, community-based organizations, and corporations. Some of his most noteworthy accomplishments include developing the Equity Training Series and serving as the founding executive director of the Equity Institute. Currently, Dr. Hotep serves as the Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging at the University of California, Berkeley. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Lasana Hotep, our keynote speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited about this opportunity uh, to the Village Demands uh, Collective at large, to uh, the leadership, uh, Dr. Emerson, uh, and everyone a part of that collective. Uh, I'm happy to be able to share, share the, the panel today with Ori and her moving words about the most perfect conditions, which um, really resonated with me. And uh, it's going to speak to some of the themes that I'm talking about. And of course, Dr. Thakima, who led us in the libation, which is opening the way and centering ourselves for the work that we have ahead. And so, um, I'm really uh, enthusiastic about today's subject, which is Black resistance in higher education. And my enthusiasm comes from multiple sources, um, partially because of the fact that uh, I have spent the better part of my career uh, in higher education, um, but also uh, because of the radical nature of the, the subject matter, right? Resistance, which is where I center a lot of my work on. And so we are here. It is February the 10th. And what has been 
known since 1976 as Black History Month, but founded as Negro History Week in 1926. And so to begin our journey, I just want to kind of contextualize Black History Month uh, and then jump into the subject matter at hand. Um, many of you all may know that the person that's credited with founding Black History Month is Dr. Carter Godwin Woodson or Carter G. Woodson, and his seminal work is the miseducation of the Negro. Uh, some of the folks on this call may have read the miseducation of Negro, some may have not. Uh, one of the key quotes I want to pull from that work uh, is this one. It's two, it's two, uh, it's a two-parter. Carter G. Woodson says, if you teach the Negro that he has accomplished as much good as any other race, and, for, and when I say Negro, for the, for the uninitiated, that was a term that was used for Black people at one point, but for the uninitiated, Negro is synonym now for what we call African-American. If you teach the Negro that he has accomplished as much as any other race, he will aspire to equality and justice without regard to race. Such an effort would upset the program of the oppressor in Africa and America. Let's keep that in mind, right? Carter G. Woodson is saying in one argument that he's making is, if we had a thorough education, as Dr. Takima said, knowledge of self, right? Then we would be in the most perfect conditions, right? Speaking to Ori, we, we wouldn't have the impediments and the barriers that we have, and we would just move forward, right? Uh, without any type of in, uh, barriers or uh, being inhibited by racialized uh, programs or racialized capitalism and, and what we're living now. He goes on to say, but if you play up before the Negro, then his crimes and shortcomings, so first you play up the crimes and shortcomings, and then you let them learn to admire the Hebrew, the Greek, the Latin, and the Tauten, lead the Negro to the, it leads the Negro to detest the man of African blood and hate himself or themselves, we should say collectively. So it's a two-parter, right? It's, it's, it's first you have to play up the shortcomings or perceived shortcomings or structural shortcomings, right? And then have them admire, right? the descendants of those who oppressed them, right? And so Carter G. Woodson wasn't just talking about Black History Month in, in terms of talking about Black first, which that plays a role in Black History Month, or just talking about Black accomplishments. But what he's basically saying is that we have, as a fiduciary responsibility as educators, is to dismantle this structural system, right, that creates a hatred and disdain for Black people outside of the African community and within the African community and the role that history plays in creating that. And so there's another scholar named Dr. John Henry Clark who says basically uh, uh, Black history are the missing pages of American history. And that becomes a very controversial statement depending on what version of quote unquote American history we are looking at, right? Um, America touts itself as a democracy and has been a democracy since its founding in 1776. And uh, to this day, we constantly talk about America being a democracy. But if you were to look at this timeline that really just chronicles um, our experience in America prior to it become, becoming a republic in 1776, Roughly from 1619 to around 1865, America definitely wasn't a democracy. It was a slaveocracy. You can't have a democracy. You can't have one person, one vote, and people being represented in these various uh, legislative bodies and judicial bodies and executive bodies if you have people enslaved, right? But if you argue that we were a democracy between 1619 in 1865 or ostensibly 1776 to 1865, then you're ignoring, right? Not only the peoples and their experiences, but you're ignoring, right? The oppression that had to take place for America to thrive as a Republic. And then roughly after the civil war, we will make an argument and say around 1872, right? When you had the compromise of 1875, 1872, 1875, 
America was an apartheid state. So, so roughly another hundred years after the end of enslavement, America was an apartheid state. It was a first citizen, first class citizen, second class citizen, Jim Crow, black codes, whatever nomenclature you want to use. It was not a democracy. And so when we think about this whole notion of being a democracy, it's roughly been from about 1965, which we marked by the passage of the Voting Rights and Civil Rights Act of 64 and 65 to the present, which is a little under 60 years. And this 60 years has not allowed us to pursue our humanity in any field of endeavor in the most perfect conditions. We still, after a slaveocracy and after apartheid, still are contested in every single space. And so when we talk about things like Black history and we talk about the men, the women, the people individually and collectively who have contributed to this wonderful global African diaspora. We're talking about people who did it in spite of all of the challenges that we have faced throughout the years. These are people who not only accomplished whatever they did in their particular contribution to humanity or their field of endeavor, but they did it in spite of all of those barriers, in spite of all the things that have been put in place to create the least perfect condition. And this is one part of the history that's left out, right? Is the in spite of, we talk about the triumph, right? Of the individuals and collectives, but we really talk about, well, what were they triumphing over? And that's because in America, we have this issue, right? Of how are we framing this? And let me give you an example of what I mean by how are we framing this particular phenomenon. There is a term that was coined in 1851 called drape to mania. And drape to mania was coined by Dr. Samuel Cartwright and, and he called it the runaway slave syndrome, right? It's an actual psychiatric diagnosis. And Dr. Samuel Cartwright wrote an article called Diseases and Peculiarities of the Negro Race. And he's a highly respected and widely published doctor from the University of Louisiana. And what he discusses was two diseases in this particular article that he claims are unique to black people. And you gotta remember this is 1851. One of the diseases was drapetomania. And it was a disease which causes slaves to run away. And the other one is diastesia ethiopica, a disease that he called rascality. And he said it made black people both free and enslaved lazy. Why am I quoting Dr. Samuel Cartwright at the beginning of this presentation about black resistance in higher education? It's because we have to really know what we're up against. And Dr. Samuel Cartwright's diagnosis of diastasia, Ethiopica, and drapetomania are very powerful because you have to understand that his argument is that people who were enslaved, when they ran away, that was a sign of a mental illness, that there was no mental illness on behalf of the people who were enslaving people and working them their, and their descendants every day until they died in perpetuity. There was no diagnosis there of the structure. There was no diagnosis of the system. The, the system that created the conditions was not to be examined. Only the people who sought to resist the system or flee the system. And this is what the paradox is. This is what we're facing right now. Because we have to decide where does the fundamental challenge reside? Does the fundamental challenge reside in those who are oppressed? Or does it reside in those who are oppressors? Does it, invite, does it reside in the individuals that are impacted by the institution? Or does it reside in the institution? See, this is a fundamental question that we have to decide before we embark on any type of work. Because the analyses that we've been given from the institutions that we've gotten our credentials from has fundamentally said that all the maladies, all the tragedies, and all the challenges that are faced, particularly in this case, as we're talking about Black resistance, amongst Black people are the fault of Black people and that they need to be studied to figure out what's wrong with them. 
not looking at the structures and the systems that create the maladies and create these particular disparate impacts and, 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 and disparate outcomes. And so when we talk about resistance, and we talk about this history of resistance, specifically in higher education, we have to have an understanding of what we're really grappling with. The great actor, activist, and singer, Paul Robeson, that if you're not familiar with Paul Robeson, I take this uh, as an opportunity, I welcome this opportunity for you to take a note of his name, right? There's a reason why many of us don't know Paul Robeson, even though he was, at the time he was alive, the greatest singer in the world, the greatest actor on stage and in film in the world, and also one of the most active uh, members of our freedom struggle in the world. Paul Robeson challenges us. He says, there are no impartial observers through the destruction in certain countries of the greatest of man's literary heritage, through the propagation of false ideas of racial and national superiority, the artist, the scientist, and the writer is challenged. The struggle invades the formerly cloistered halls of our universities and our other seats of learning. Paul Robeson tells us, the battlefront is everywhere. There is no sheltered rear. And so speaking about being in higher education, in these cloistered halls, whether we have the four-year university or two-year community college, right? We are part of this battle that he speaks of, and we must make decisions, and we must take sides, because the battlefront is everywhere. Because if you just think about just the basics of education, right, not even getting to the academy yet, our people come from a circumstance where there were anti-literacy laws. See, when we're talking about all of the striving and the Black excellence that we have and we, we overcame, we have to talk about what are we overcoming from? See, that's one of the parts that's left out. People will talk about how great Martin Luther King is. Well, why did Martin Luther King have to be great? What was he being great against, right? And that's what we're going to talk about in the first part of our presentation. You know, in Virginia, should free Negroes or their children assemble a school to learn reading or writing, any justice of the peace may dismiss the school with 20 stripes on the back of every pupil. This is the cost of education. In Louisiana, the penalty for instructing a free black in a Sunday school is for the first offense, $500 for the second offense, death. These are the odds, the perceivably and conceivably insurmountable odds that we face in just basic learning, reading, and writing. And so the fact that we ha have learned reading and writing, and the fact that we had such a significant population of free Blacks during antebellum America who could read and write, lets you know that the narrative of that we're from a community that don't value education is a false narrative. It is a false narrative because against the penalty of death, we were teaching and learning in antebellum America, in the slaveocracy. And so this is the foundation when we begin to talk about Blacks in higher education. Before the Civil War, educational opportunities for free Black children, particularly in higher education, were quite limited, even in the North. Some students, however, managed to leap over the hurdles standing in their way. John Chavis, a free black man from North Carolina, was the first African-American college student. Chavis studied as a private student under the president of the College of New Jersey, now known as Princeton University, and continued his studies at Liberty Hall Academy in Virginia. In 1862, Mary Jane Patterson became the first African-American woman to receive a bachelor's degree when she graduated from Oberlin College. Patterson became a teacher and then the first black principal at the Preparatory School for Negroes, now known as Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School. Before the Civil War, discrimination against black students led to the founding of the first black colleges in the North including Wilberforce in Ohio and Lincoln and Cheney Universities in Pennsylvania. Cheney University in Philadelphia is the first historically black college or university. It was founded in 1837 as the Institute of Colored Youth. The founding of that institution 
transforms educational possibility for African American people. The era saw huge growth in the number of black colleges and universities, from Howard and Fisk to Hampton and Tuskegee. Historically, black colleges and universities take African Americans who struggle in our failing public schools and turn them into a rigorous scholar with access to a future who has earned the credentials for a college degree. HBCUs arose as a direct response to racial discrimination, providing opportunities for black students to gain a higher education and enter the middle class. According to the New York Times, HBCUs make up only 3% of the colleges across the country. And yet, at least 50% of black doctors and 80% of black judges have graduated from their classes. There remains a significant racial gap in degree attainment, but this gap is shrinking thanks to these black institutions and to increased black enrollment in historically white colleges and universities. And so in that clip, you got pretty much the gist, right? Uh, a, a very abbreviated, truncated uh, narrative about the journey from the first black person that was admitted to a college all the way to the development of HBCUs and what HBCUs have produced and also our engagement in predominantly white institutions. But again, this notion of black resistance in higher education, what were we resisting? What, what are we resisting? So when we have these kinds of conversations or these types of themes, Many of us who are on this call and some of us who are not on this call get accused of introducing race into education, right? That somehow education before we begin to have these conversations was some type of universalist, you know, humanistic utopia. And then when people begin to talk about blackness and anti-blackness and racism and white supremacy, we're introducing race into education. So let's see if that particular argument holds true, right? We're gonna look at four different phenomena. The phenomenon of eugenics, Dr. Lewis Terman, Dr. Carl C. Brigham, and Dr. Richard J. Hernstein. Eugenics, right? for those who are not familiar, is the study of how to arrange reproduction within a human population to increase the occurrence of heritable characteristics regarded as desirable, developed largely by Francis Galton as a method of improving, improving the human race. And then listen how they end the definition. It fell into disfavor only after the perversion of its doctrines by the Nazis. Right? So eugenics is basically a pseudoscience that was treated as a hard science that made the argument that there is a hierarchy in the human race with those who have been classified as the white, and sometimes they use the term Aryan, and sometimes they use the term Caucasian, at the top. And then all other human beings falling below that till you get to the very bottom of the hierarchy where the African resides, right? And the reason why they made the argument that it was a perversion with the uh, Holocaust of so over 6 million Jewish people during the reign of Nazi Germany is because they're saying that that wasn't the intent of the actual theory, but th the Nazis carried this ridiculous theory out to its logical conclusions, to a tragic logical conclusion. It, it was okay until you did this extermination, right? But then when you actually acted on this deplorable, inhumane theory in so-called science, then it becomes a quote-unquote perversion. It was perverted from its beginnings to say that there's a ranking based on race, right? This racialized ranking with the whites at the top and the blacks at the bottom and every other group fighting to not uh, empower themselves or be self-determination, but to be aligned with whiteness. So let's think about this theory of eugenics. Lewis Terman, who was Lewis Terman? Terman is a guy who created something called the Stanford Binet IQ test. And the IQ test, for those who don't know, is the test that most people in the West use to measure intelligence. Well, what about Terman? The Stanford Binet IQ test, a development which made both him and Stanford University well known throughout the United States. Terman's interest in intelligence was motivated and shaped by Terman's deep belief in eugenics. So are you asked, are you telling us, Lasana, that the founder? of the main test used in Western society for intelligence was a eugenicist and eugenics 
is a racist notion that there's a pure white race and that everybody should either be a part of that white race or some way be a, a, a prohibited in their movement? Yes, the founder of the IQ test was a eugenicist. Carl C. Brigham, what did Carl bring to the table? Carl is known as the father of the SAT. Yes, one of the major standardized tests that is used to measure intelligence and used for college admittance, but also the foundation of most standardized tests that we have in America. He became interested in mental testing while a student at where? Princeton. First we have Stanford, now we have Princeton. He later became a psychology professor at the university where he was an enthusiastic member of the eugenics movement. Do y'all see a pattern here? When we talk about black resistance in higher education, at the highest echelons of education, the founders of the instruments that we use till this day were rooted in the eugenics movement. And then we have their an antecedents, an American psychologist, Richard Herrnstein at Harvard. So now we got Stanford, Princeton, and Harvard who co-authored the Bell Theory with Charles Murray. They argue that there's an inherent link between race and intelligence. Do y'all see this through line, right? Do y'all see this through line? From the founders of the SAT, the founders of the IQ test, Harvard professors writing in the 90s, constantly making this argument, constantly positioning this whiteness, this white purity, right? As a way in which you should legitimately engage in academic discourse. So for those who say those of us who talk about racism or white supremacy or blackness or anti-blackness have introduced race into education, that absolutely wrong. It has been introduced by Carl C. Brigham. It has been introduced by Lewis Terman. It has been introduced by Richard Herrnstein and a plethora of other so-called scholars. This is foundation. Another reason why I go through this process is because we have this notion that people who are racist are quote unquote ignorant, right? And that is rooted in ignorance. These are some of the most learned people on the planet, Stanford, Princeton, Harvard. It's not rooted in ignorance. Some of us could argue that it's intentional. Some of us could argue this is the reason why Carter G. Woodson knew that history in the university had been used and had been weaponized to maintain the status quo, would maintain this hierarchical system. And so even when we talk about not just the scholars, we can talk about the politicians, right? The political opposition to Blackness, the political anti-Blackness within the university. Guard of State Police as Governor George Wallace appeals for calm and prepares to confront a deputy U.S. attorney. The federal officers are armed with a proclamation from President Kennedy urging the governor to end his efforts to prevent two Negro students from registering at the university. The governor is adamant. He made a campaign promise to stand in the doorway himself to prevent the integration of the last all-white state university. After the federal officers leave, there's a lull of several hours while President Kennedy federalizes the Alabama National Guard and they move to the campus. Brigadier General Henry Graham arrives to tell the governor, it's my sad duty to ask you to step aside on orders of the President of the United States. The governor yields to federal authority, but promises to continue what he terms a constitutional fight. There was no untoward incident at any time during this confrontation of state and federal authority. Five minutes after the governor leaves, James Hood is the first of his race to become a University of Alabama student. He is followed into the registrar's office by Vivian Malone. Both the students are 20 years old and will take summer courses. That was in 1963 at the University of Alabama. The most perfect conditions is what our sister was talking about. The President of the United States has to nationalize the Guard and send all these authorities for Black people to do what? To go to school. We're just trying to go to school. Look at this. For us to go to school, the insurmountable odds, the resistance to us, this is what we have to resist. In one of the seminal works 
on black move the black movement or black power movement on campus the book by martha biondi called the black revolution on, on campus biondi says with remarkable organization and skill this generation of black students talk about the students in the 60s challenged the fundamental tenets of university life they insisted that public universities should reflect and serve the peoples of their communities that private universities should rethink the mission of elite education and that historically black colleges should survive the era of integration and shift their mission to community-based black empowerment. Most crucially, black students demanded a role in the definition and production of scholarly knowledge. And so this movement, right, and this, this activity, for students and non-students alike, right, which led to what Beyond is calling the Black Revolution on campus, led to the actual development of a field of study, which in some places is called Black Studies, some places is called Africana Studies, and other places Africology. But this movement and resistance, primarily by students, and community members who weren't even college students led to this field that is popularly known as Black Studies. One key aspect of the Black Power Movement was the call for self-determination. To many young Black people, this meant taking control of their education, moving the history of African Americans in this country from the margins to the center. By the time we hit the late 1960s, there are more numbers of black students who begin to enter campuses as a result of the activism that is taking place in the rest of the country. Stokely Carmichael is really the biggest activist who participated in both civil rights and black power during the 60s. He was a freedom writer and sat in on lunch counters. He knew Dr. Martin Luther King Jr went to jail 27 times between 1961 and 1966. Stokely and the Black Power Movement really helped transform the Black student movement into a Black studies movement that is demanding Black history be taught at all universities and even high schools. In 1968, protests erupted at San Francisco State College. The school's Black Student Union launched a massive student strike that lasted five months. San Francisco State in 1968 is a game changer because these are protesters who are disciplined but at the same time are ready to confront the police. Students are going to be arrested and they are determined to transform San Francisco State. The success of the San Francisco State College strike would spread to nearly 200 other colleges across the country. The results of the student protests led to the recruitment of more brown and black students, the hiring of black professors and administrators, and the creation of black studies departments. And so with the development of black studies departments, you heard uh, Dr. Peniel Joseph speak uh, about Stokely Carmichael, who would later change his name to Kwame Ture, and about this, this, this activity, right? This beehive of activity around students and community folks who help bring this into um, fruition. Um, I went to college in the 90s. I didn't go to college in the 60s. But in the 90s, the first speaker that we brought as a student organization was Kwame Ture. That's him in the middle, in the blue, uh, full of booba. At the time, he lived in uh, Guinea. Um, but he would make tours on behalf of the All African Revolutionaries People Party of the United States of America. And then that's a young Masana Hotep with the red circle around him. That was our organization at the time. It was called Black Watch. We eventually changed our name to Kamasi, which meant the Black Rebellion. And spending the time with Kwame Ture, right, was really informative on multiple levels and really uh, helped shape the direction of our organization because our organization had two major thrusts. One was a scholarly thrust, and then one was an activist thrust. And the scholarly thrust existed because our institution, a predominantly white institution, Texas State University, 
uh, at that time called Southwest Texas State University, did not have an African-American studies program, major or minor. They had two African-American history classes and that was it, right? The way that we learned is we went to the campus library and we went to this one particular section of the campus library called the E-185 section. And we went to the E-185 section, uh, members of the organization, and we all had a calendar. And on Wednesday nights, we would teach Black history, Black issues, right? And we all had a responsibility. So we'd go to E-185 section, we see a book on Marcus Garvey by Tony Martin. We would have somebody would have to study that. And then on that Wednesday, it was the Marcus Garvey night. Another person would have to teach on Fannie Lou Hamer. Another person would teach Anthony Browder's works. Another person would teach Wade Noble's works. And this is how we actually taught each other, right? Actually building on this momentum and this tradition. And so in um, this particular piece, From Black Power to Black Studies, um, the author quotes St. Clair Drake, for those who are not familiar, St. Clair Drake was the great African-American sociologist uh, who initially you know, published Black Metropolis, but then eventually went on to found the African-American Studies Department at Stanford. And in this particular piece, um, St. Clair Drake is quoted as saying this, what Black studies were turning out to be was neither what their most youthful, dedicated supporters had envisioned, nor what white faculties and administrators had wanted them to accept. The Black Studies movement was becoming institutionalized in the sense that it had moved from the conflict phase to the adjustment to the existing educational system, with some of its value being accepted by that system. A trade-off was involved. Black Studies had become depoliticized and de-radicalized. And this is very important because as Black studies became a more uh, accepted field of study, the roots of it, the radicalization of it, the disrupting the status quo had lost some of its steam. And it just became another academic unit within the liberal arts or the humanities or wherever it was situated within the institution. And the scholarship began to reflect that. And so one of the crises that we have now in terms of our Black resistance is our intellectual material, right, that we're grappling with, the, times of, the types of questions and the types of frameworks that we're putting forth, right? Because just because, uh, I would argue, just because the subject is Black people, or we're talking about a Black phenomenon, or we're talking about uh, something that may or may not impact Black life specifically, doesn't mean that it comes from the radical tradition. Doesn't mean that it shouldn't be talked about, but it should not be confused. Because where we are now in our particular uh, uh, struggle in Black studies and Black frameworks in general came from a long battle. Because when I was in college in the 90s and we were bringing people like Kwame Toure and Julia Hare to campus, we were in the midst of a academic and intellectual war. Right? There was actual pushback. This is one of the examples of that. Right, This book written by Mary Lefkowitz called Not Out of Africa, subtitled How Afrocentrism Became an Excuse to Teach Myth as History. And it literally was a all-out war on the cover of the, the most uh, prominent publications, whether it was Time Magazine or the New York Times or the New Yorker, and these Black scholars, some of them African-centered, some of them not African-centered, about what really are we talking about when we talk about centering Black people, right? Centering Black people. Because that's one of several particular ways in which we look at this Black studies. And so Dr. Abdul, Al Kalamat wrote a book called The History of Black Studies. And he says, Black studies have these particular five elements. They study and teach about African-Americans and often African and other African-descended people, where Black people themselves are the main agents or protagonists of the study and learning. We counter racism and, and, we, and it contributes to human liberation. It celebrates the Black experience and that it see it as a uh, precious case among many in the universality of the human condition, right? And so I highlighted these two pieces that when we talk about Black studies, are we the main agents? Meaning that we're not just looking at when Black people are on the peripheral or when Black people were allowed to do something, but where do we have agency, right? One of the examples I always use when I'm teaching about what it means to be uh, African-centered or have agency is this, is if we look at something like, you know, the phenomena of baseball, 
Black people in the history of baseball normally starts with Jackie Robinson, right? And nothing wrong with Jackie Robinson. But Jackie Robinson came from an entire league that was owned and ran by Black people called the Negro Leagues, right? There's very little talk about the history of the Negro Leagues and what Black people in baseball looked like. And, I mean, in terms of that experience looked like, right? We don't talk about Rube Foster, who was the owner and founder of the, the latest, the most recent contemporary version of the Negro Leagues. We know more about Jackie Robinson than we know about Rube Foster. And Rube Foster owned an actual full baseball league that had teams that are playing against white teams in secret. That's what we mean by agency, right? Encounter racism and contribute to human liberation. This is the anti-racist piece of Black studies. This is the anti-racist movement that we have within our work and our responsibility as educators. And so when you think about, right, how all of this history, right, has culminated and still manifests itself in contemporary times. We had this huge movement in 2015 where students were taking over offices, right, and students were making demands. And we still have it post George Floyd where students were taking over offices and making demands. These are some students at Princeton University in 2015. So I agree with you that Woodrow Wilson was a racist. I think we need to acknowledge that as a community and uh, be honest uh, about that. And I don't think that you as a white person understand what it's like to walk past a building or to be studying in a school. I'm not but assigning a few other people like this to be studying in a school and to have that on your diploma. Um, Woodrow well, Wilson perpetuated an ideology that has led to the continual genocide of black people in this country. He is a murderer. We owe him nothing. This university owes us everything. I walk around this campus understanding that this was built on the backs of my people, and I owe none of you guys anything. We owe white people nothing. And so this activism, right, this particular uh, act of taking over the president's office for several days came as a result of wanting to change the name of a a program that they had named after Woodrow Wilson, who was a president of the United States, but he was not only the president of the United States, he was also an active and, uh, white supremacist. And the students were saying that you don't understand to have to be in an institution where you look on the walls and you see pictures of, and you go into the buildings or you're, or, or you're, you're studying under a program that's named after people who have stor historically uh, been against the very people who, uh, who you say that you want to have an inclusive, diverse, and um, an equitable relationship with, right? But they're just following tradition, right? We've always had student activism. We've always had resistance. Even at HBCUs, we had an activist uh, movement at Howard University in 1989, and that built off of the momentum that was done at a lot of the schools in 1969. As you see this famous picture of the brothers walking out of the main hall at Cornell University armed to the teeth in 1969. And so this is all part of a trajectory. This is all part of a legacy of us constantly, right, trying to battle to create the most perfect conditions. And when you look at something like this, back to George Wallace when he was standing in front of Alabama University, he said, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever, right? And this is a sitting governor of the state of Alabama. But today we have this version of that. This is a comic that someone put together on the internet. I saw teachers in the closet making critical race theory and I saw one of the critical race theories and the critical race theory looked at me and said, I did slavery. And so now we have a sitting governor in the state of Florida, right? Ron DeSantis. And he has um, pushed back on African-American studies, AP African-American studies, and later the college board was forced to uh, amend its uh, standards for AP African-American studies. But he is not a lone solo maverick out here. He's doing this work because they have the data. And it says over the last two decades, Republican voters have become increasingly convinced that too much black history is being taught in public schools, right? There's a, a consensus among certain members of the American public, right? That there's too much black history, right? Which I've never heard that mentioned by anybody of any race ever, right? One of the arguments that is not enough. So for it to be an argument of too much is really ridiculous, right? And then how do you quantify that, 
right? And it and they're quantifying it by this this centering of comfort, right? To another comic, uh, Washington Post uh, had this particular thing posted, where the new Underground Railroad is smuggling in Black history. But again, this argument about who's comfortable, right? No one really argued about the comfort or discomfort of First Nation students learning about things like the Trail of Tears and or the extermination of their people by the Western frontiersmen. No one argued about the comfort or discomfort of Black students when they had to learn about enslavement and learn about Jim Crow and learn about lynching and read books that had the N-word in them in the narrative. No one argued about the comfort or discomfort of our Latinx or Latin A communities when they had to learn about the migrant workers and learn about how immigration is talked about in this country and learn about how this was originally uh, the land of Mexico and was taken, right? No one talks about the discomfort of our Chinese American, our Asian American and Polynesian brothers and sisters in terms of the Polynesian brothers and sisters having their, uh, their, their nations colonized and islands colonized and the uh, Asian and Asian Pacific, American, uh, Asian Pacific American students having to deal with the, opi uh, the, uh, opio, um, the opium uh, wars and the uh, uh, Chinese exclusion acts and all these other things. No one centered their comfort but now all of a sudden we're worrying about the comfort of a particular group of students. For example, this notion that um, students should not be uh, uh, um, exposed to anything that makes them feel uncomfortable, discomfort, or any sense of, this is my favorite, personal responsibility <laughs> uh, for anything that's ever happened in history. Anybody that's ever you know, studied history in any sort of serious way knows that you feel a range of emotions. And 70% of the time, those emotions are not positive, you know, emotions that make you feel good about the world. The goal of education isn't, you know, to uh, tell you that, you know, the world is, is sunshine and rainbows. The goal is enlightenment. The goal is some deeper understanding of humanity. And that's what, you know, you, you, you hopefully are trying to get across uh, to students. This is what's... So that was the great writer, ta Coates. So what are we talking about, right? What we're talking about lends us to the historian Robin D.G. Kelly's book, Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination. We're talking about now we know what we're up against, right? And what do we do about it? You know, Robin says, without new visions, we don't know what to build, only what to knock down. We not only end up confused, rudderless, and cynical, but we forget that making a revolution is not a series of clever maneuvers and tactics, but a process that can and must transform us. It's a process that can and must transform us. And so going back to that piece of agency, we'll borrow from the African proverb that says, if you wish to move mountains tomorrow, you must start by lifting the stones today. So what are the stones that we're gonna lift today, right? What are the things within our locus of control of our power, right? I don't wanna create this whole narrative that these are insurmountable odds, right? But I just also want us to understand what we're really up against, because if you know what you're really up against, then you'll create strategy in response to what you're really up against. But if you have this illusion or delusion about what we're fighting, you'll create strategies for that. And those things push us further away from recreating those most perfect conditions. We're trying to get to a world where we can create, to the best of our ability, the most perfect conditions for us to blossom individually and collectively. But we can't do that if we're operating off of false assumptions. So let's start with our students or our scholars. What does Black resistance look like today, right? It really looks like this whole fight about pedagogy. Right? We have to continue to have our students fight for inclusive pedagogy, that the curriculum must be turned inside out in every discipline. There are no sacred cows. There are no, well, there is no race to uh, geometry. Geometry is just geometry. Our chemistry is just chemistry. We cannot fall victim to these particular types of arguments because when you take any subject matter, they attempt to try to tell you the founding of it and the history of it. And it's amazing that every subject matter that we learn about was founded in Rome or Greece, for real. Nobody had any of these sciences. Even before the creation of Roman Greece, human beings were inventing technologies. And even when we have on record where certain kinds of technologies were borrowed or stolen from other people, they don't get the credit. 
So we have to reimagine this. And the students have the power, right, to demand these inclusive pedagogies. But you might have to go to your version of the E-185 sections, right? We used to have to go to the actual library. You might have to go do some research either di digitally, right, or in some archives and find out and say, hey, this is what's missing and we have to have a full experience. And then the students also have to continue to fight for support resources. And the support resources we're talking about really, really, really became apparent during the COVID-19 moment. And I love whenever I get an opportunity and I borrowed this from Dr. Lauren Ford's uh, dissertation because she shared this on her dissertation defense. And I like to share it with people when I get a chance because it speaks to what I'm talking about when I say the fight for support resources. The person posted, COVID-19 is showing you the facts that American capitalism has lied, what, what American capitalism has lied about. It's showing how many of you support socialism when it's convenient for you or the people you care for. Children could have gotten laptops and free Wi-Fi this whole time. Wi-Fi could have been a utility this whole time. Stores could have been allowing seniors to shop for one hour assisted. Stores could have closed earlier to give stockers and cleaners proper time to stock and recover this whole time. College students could have frozen interest rates on student loans this whole time. Pregnant women, disabled people, and single parents could have worked from home this whole time. Abandoned federal buildings could have been used for homeless people. Students could learn from home instead of being suspended for a lack of transportation to school this whole time. Bill payment could have been furloughed this whole time. Evictions for hard times could have been delayed this whole time. Co-pays and other out-of-pocket health provider fees could have been waived. Not turning someone's electricity or water off in desperate times so they can survive could have happened this whole time. Airfare could have been cheaper this whole time. Sick people could have been encouraged to take this time off and given paid time off to care for themselves. The bottom line is humanity could have been humane this whole time. And so this is what we're talking about when we're arguing about the supports. We're not arguing for some kind of pie in the sky. We've actually had to live in this situation in the COVID-19 moment. And we don't need to let the things that we were able to secure in that moment be fleeting. Because as this person is arguing, if we could do it then, we could do it this whole time. What does it look like for classified professionals? Classified professionals have an opportunity to argue for inclusive equity practices. A lot of our classified professionals are frontline, right? They're dealing with the populations that are attending our institutions, right? While some of our programs that we manage have a certain percentage of population, ANR has 100% participation because you cannot get into our institutions without admissions and records. They do it 100%. And then depending on the district that you're in, right, financial aid deals with a significant percentage, right, and so on and so forth. And so we have to have this battle for inclusive equity practices with our student population, but also within the classified professional ranks themselves. And then the classified professionals have to continue their resistance to have agency in decision-making and not be an afterthought and not just being told or informed after the fact, but have a seat at the table where their experience that they're having with students and their experience right within the workforce is being taken into consideration when these decisions are being made and they have to be executed. This is what resistance looks like. What about our faculty? What about our faculty, the agency we have and having a more inclusive faculty body, right? That's representative of the students. We have all of the data from all of our colleagues in Sacramento and all the other research bureaus in Oakland and San Francisco that tells us the disproportionate ways in which our white brothers and sisters are represented in the faculty ranks and in the, the um, faculty union, right? And in the academic Senate in communities that are predominantly black, Latinx, Asian Pacific Islander. And our faculty have to not only want to see people of color and or women and or queer folks in the ranks, but we have to have culturally fluent and racially literate faculty colleagues, right? That it has to go beyond just your particular identity, but also your identity and your competencies and fluencies. What does this future of the resistance look like for administrators? Administrators are gonna to have to fight against this neoliberal, neoliberal agenda, this corporatizing of colleges, right? Because the corporatizing of colleges is having us treat DEI work like it's risk management work. That is really like, let's identify the risk, let's neutralize the risk, and let's get back to our core business. When our core business has to be rooted in equity. And we have to stop yielding to the advocates of the status quo. There are so many people at our institutions who want things to quote unquote, go back to where they were. And they're constantly working in creative ways 
in committees, in task force that we ostensibly think are supposed to make the institution more equitable, but these folks are constantly undermining our equity efforts. This is what the resistance looks like. And so coming back to Carla G. Woodson before I close, Black History Month, Black resistance isn't just this random, tangential, trivial act. It's about the preservation of people. It's about our preservation. It's not about a listing of random facts. It's not about historical dates. It's not about prominent people. It's not even just about a Black generic heritage. He argues that if a race has no history, if it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes negligible factor in thought in the in the thought of the world, and it stands in danger of being exterminated. And so we're rooting ourselves in this history and this legacy of resistance because we are rooting ourselves in the preservation for ourselves and seven generations after us, which we learned from our First Nation brothers and sisters. So with that being said. I would like to thank everybody for their time and attention for engaging us in this process. And the floor is open for question and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hotep. And, and you can see the, the love and the um, thanks and appreciation that uh, the community today has shared with you in the chat. We do have a, a few questions that were sent um, through the Q&A. And for uh, the community's awareness, if we are unable to answer all of the questions, please know that we will um, get answers from Dr. Hotep and get those out to the community so that you can um, have a response to, to the questions and, and see um, the information, the knowledge that is shared even further with us today. Please just, just call me Lasana. Just call me Lasana. Lasana. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Lasana, you mentioned the governor of Florida, but why when it comes to black history, does our race have to take on other political issues outside of race like LGBTQ? As black people throughout the diaspora, why can't we focus on the issues of black people regardless of sexuality? As people of African descent, we are already inclusive. And would you please tackle this from both sides? I'm glad y'all starting with the light stuff. <laughs> um, and I will tackle it from multi multiple sides, but I also want to leave room for other questions. Uh, so to answer the question directly, the reason why we have to take on uh, various communities um, in terms of, in this particular case, LBGTQI, is because a lot of, uh, of identity work is under the rubrics of intersectionality. And the intersectionality argument is it comes primarily from which at one point scholarly and in real life, women and queer folks were left out of the equation, right? So you would talk about this whole combination of race, gender, and class, right? That's kind of where the inclusiveness come from. The challenge with that is that when gender was initially introduced in this argument about identities, and especially when it comes to government, protected identities, the protected identities piece uh, in terms of women being classified as gender was not put in under an intersectional argument. It was actually introduced as an opposition to Black men being able to be full citizens. So you have to know the history of the so-called women's suffrage movement. And as, as much as women collectively owe to Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Staten, they were uh, ostensibly against Black people. They were anti they, they were they were practitioners of anti-blackness. And one of the main arguments they made was why would you give the black man the right to vote before you gave the white women the right to vote? We're your real allies. Right. And so a lot of these particular, and you got to know the history of all this stuff. And Tommy Curry breaks all of this stuff down. But the, a lot of the history of this so-called inclusion of race, class, gender, and conflating it with conflating gender and class with race comes from this intersectional argument that initially was put put out to disrupt Black people's progress. Um, and But what happens, it was successful. They didn't think it was going to go there. They thought it was just going to keep Black people from progressing. It was added on there. And then what happens is uh, all the statistical data that we've had since 1965 to today, the most um, uh, prominent benefactor of um, affirmative action has been white women. Right. So that's one reason why it's conflated. 
In terms of the argument that we're already inclusive enough, um, that argument can be made, but all communities have various folks with multiple identities. Um, but to get to the, the essence of your argument, we do have to be nuanced and savvy enough to be able to talk about those things that are unique to Blackness while still being in solidarity with other communities, whether they're racialized communities, whether they're uh, sexual orientation or a class or whatever, however we want to uh, look at different alliances and, and groups that we have. Uh, that was my um, timer to make sure I shut up on time. Um, but we also have to be nuanced enough to say that we have to have this conversation as people of African ancestry, not as an exclusionary act because we're better than other people, it's because we have to recognize our unique sojourn and the unique consequences, right? And so if you if you look at the history, just looking at just the basic history of America, Black people have pretty much served as the fodder, right? Always the front lines, always the ones getting the dogs sick on them, beat up, maligned, uh, brought to court, right? Uh, uh, all that, and then the other groups that have identities, will come in and they will sit and have their seat at the table or move forward or what have you. Not saying that nobody had battles, right? Everybody had their own different types of battles. But I'm talking about in the Black freedom movement, the things that we were able to move the needle on that opened the door for everyone else. But then when a lot of times when other communities and identities were able to get at that table, they weren't as strong as allies or in solidarity with us in ways that we thought they were. I can't hear you. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, so next question. What resistance is necessary and possible when everywhere you go on campus, folks are supporting DEIA work and sitting on equity committees, yet gaps persist because of optional professional development and proponents of academic freedom, suggesting that structural changes in curriculum and decolonizing classes will unduly impose on them? Math and English instructors hold to state standards and argue that their curriculum cannot be changed. Man, I love it. This is an enriching dialogue. So, so two things. Um, in terms of how do you keep the work up, you kind of got to pick where you're going to have the site of the battle that you feel like you can have the earliest victories, right? So that's that's kind of just the short answer. The longer answer is this, is we have to understand what we mean when we say diversity, equity, and inclusion. A lot of us have this situation where people are allowed to just define terms. In terms of equity, especially in education, we already had it defined, right? Estella Ben-Simone, uh, ben they already defined it. They said that it's the allocation of human, fiscal, and intellectual resources to close gaps or remove barriers, right? So letting so one of the first faux pas I find when I go work with institutions is they say, we got a community together to define what equity means for us. It's already been defined. That's like saying, we, we got a community together to define what green means to us. Green is green, right? <laughs> we know what green is. So first of all, we have to go with the, the authorities in the definition so that people don't come up with these definitions that, that, that don't implicate, right? Because people are trying to create solutions to problems without any implication. But there's victims, but there's no perpetrator. Right, that goes back to Eduardo Benio Silva's work called Racism Without Racist. We got all this racism in society, but no one's a racist. Right? So that's one of the things. Another one of the things we have to understand in terms of the framing of what we're really dealing with uh, in DEIB and curriculum and all these other kinds of things is this defaulting to compliance, right? Maintains the status quo. So the argument I make to my colleagues in education is this. If the reason why we can't create more equitable outcomes is because of this course outline of record or this particular procedure that comes down from Sacramento or whatever, whatever, are we actually arguing that structurally we have created structures that's producing these outcomes, right? That the barrier is actually the structure. So 
What that tells me is one of two things. That one, you're admitting that it, it's structural and institutional, that your course outline of record by, by its development or by this policy of financial aid at the federal or state level or what have you that you're citing, policy, procedure, or practice, is structurally creating this outcome. And then two, where are you at in terms of solidarity and locking arms with us so that we can change this structurally? Because just resigning and throwing your hands up saying, well, I really would like to be more diverse and equitable, but the compliance document says this, right? So, so you're saying that you're fine with the outcomes. You're fine with the suffering. So one of the things I, I have conversations with our colleagues with and a lot of leaders within institutions and even board of trustees is we have to ask ourselves this fundamental question. Are we centering the suffering of our students or the comfort of our colleagues? Like that's where we start the conversation because that will guide and tell us what types of steps we need to take. Because what happens is that as soon as folks begin to uh, center the suffering of our students, all of these arguments begin to come that was about the, our, our colleagues, right? And comforting them and centering them. So we have to just decide and then just let it be known. Just say, at such and such and such and such district, we prefer the comfort of the faculty over the suffering of the students. And that is gonna guide our DEI work. Just say it, just be out there with it. Or say at our such and such district, we center the suffering of our students over the comfort of our colleagues. Therefore, even if it makes us uncomfortable, we are going to do this work because this work is gonna relieve the human suffering of our students. Because, and I'll use another example I use, and you know, if y'all ever invite me to come talk to your school, and I doubt it after the way I talk so crazy, Stokely Carmichael today, is this, is we have, we might not have everything we want, but we have physical plant buildings. We have uh, faculty colleagues, someone with terminal degrees. We have budgets, may not be the budget we want, but we got money, right? We have uh, training beyond our graduate school and undergraduate training. And we have policies and procedures. We have all these things, and we have much more, but I'll just use this example. And then for sake of an argument, an 18 year old shows up or a 35 year old that's recareering shows up. They don't have a degree. How do they neutralize all these things we have? How all of a sudden we got, why do we have all that stuff and we can't teach them? It makes no sense. Why would we have all the physical plan, financial resources, terminal degrees, undergraduate education, training, and then a person shows up with none of those things, just their individual selves. And we say, well, well in the end of us, we can't teach, we can't. This, this is what I'm talking about, right? And this is how we have to interrogate these arguments of people who, and that's why I made the, one of the slides about administrators, is battling those who want to maintain the status quo. Because it's never really, quote unquote, the thing that people are saying, whether it's the course outline of record or policy of practice, because we know that with course outlines of records, with policy of practice, we've seen people do what they really want to do. What they're really saying is that I don't want to do this. And the thing that I'm going to, that's going to protect me, but still make me look like a good person is going to be this policy, practice, or procedure, or tradition. No, thank you very, very much for, for that, uh, those powerful words and, and that, that reminder to all of us that, you know, and you started your, your um, keynote um, with that, the, what, are, what are we centering and focusing our efforts on and, and making sure it is the students. Um, we do have a few more questions that have been asked. Um, I will share with the group that we're not unfortunately going to be able to have um, Lasana answer those live for us today, but um, he, through his kindness, he will um, share that with us and we'll get that out to the community. And there were some questions about the recording of the session as well, and that um, you can email um, the Village Demands and um, it will be up on our YouTube page as well. Um, again, thank you very much, um, Lasana, Dr. Hotap, for, for joining us today and, and um, sharing with us and keeping us charged and re-energized as we move forward in our work. Um, very much appreciate uh, you and your time. 
And um, with that, I would like to also ask um, the Village Demand President, uh, Dr. Dana Emerson, to, to please um, join us and, and share a few words in closing. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, what does Black resistance in higher education look like today? Everybody needs to address that. So let's just remember resistance. Resistance is the ability not to be affected by something. So let's think about that when we're talking about Black resistance in higher education. As we close out this amazing opportunity to be schooled and learned by Dr. Lasana Hotap, I just wanna say thank you so much to everyone who is part of this entire event. I wanna thank our guests, Dr. Mayasa, Ori Johnson, and of course, the wonderful and very thoughtful and passionate Dr. Lasana Hotep. In addition to our guests today, I'd like to also thank the sponsors for this event, American River College, Coastline College and Maramoja Program, Monterey Peninsula College, San Diego Mesa College and RSS Consulting. And most importantly, I'd like to thank you, the Village Demands Program Committee, Dr. Sophia Forbes, Lakeisha Bradley, Dr. Veronica Garache, and Dr. BJ Snowden. And I would be remiss if I did not point out the superstar behind everything, Brandon Christian. Thank you so much for being here and helping us out and all of you who signed up and participated in this wonderful opportunity, I wanna thank you too. I just wanna go back and just remind you that today we were taken on a timeline, reminding us that our greatness and excellence is accomplished in spite of the structures, policies, procedures, and practices designed to destroy and erase us. We have to ask, what are we overcoming from? And then we have to go forward and push forward. What does that resistance look like? Thank you again from the Village Demands. Thank you all. I hope you are having a wonderful Black Excellence month, year, lifetime, universe, journey. Again, I am Dr. Dana Emerson. I am the president of the Village Demands, and I want to say thank you for joining us today. Have a wonderful afternoon and a great weekend.